Hello there, and welcome to this course in Cognitive Linguistics. The fact that you're watching this video tells me that you probably know what linguistics is, and you probably also have already some kind of idea of what cognitive linguistics might be. Nonetheless, let me explain a bit what this course will be about. So, um, as you expect, it's an introduction to cognitive linguistics, and I will present cognitive linguistics as the study of language in terms of general cognitive processes, such as categorization, schematization, or analogy. Now, these are called domain general cognitive processes because they are not restricted to language. We don't just use them in language processing or language production, but rather they're also at work in other cognitive tasks that you do as a human being. Right, so in this course in these videos you'll find out about the assumptions and goals of cognitive linguistics. I will try to cover its main research themes and I'll also say a few things about how the field has developed since its inception in the early 80s. Now, um, here are some of the topics that I will discuss. Metaphor, of course, looms large in cognitive linguistics. Categorization, prototypes, that's another important topic. Polysemy, words with multiple meanings, um, we'll talk about that. Conceptual blending, the conceptual integration of very different ideas. Frame semantics, how, how words get their meanings from the frames, the situations in which they are used. Usage-based models of language, the idea that experience with language shapes your knowledge of language. Cognitive grammar, um, cognitive approach to grammar that tries to reduce it to basic cognitive processes and principles, and construction grammar, which you might know is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Okay, so these are some of the things that I'll try to cover. Um, what will be going on in this video? In this video, I'll ask the question, what is cognitive linguistics? Uh, don't expect a full tour of the territory, right? Um, so I'm just going to ask a few questions and thereby try to explain um, what this beast, uh, cognitive linguistics, really is. So here um, I have four little clouds that uh, are meant to symbolize thoughts that perhaps are on your mind right now. So some of you might be thinking, well, Cognitive linguistics, it has this word cognitive in it. Is it perhaps a branch of psycholinguistics? Hmm. Um, other people might think, well, cognitive linguistics is associated with uh, types of linguistics that, that call themselves functional. Yeah? It's concerned with the communicative functions of language, and there are formal approaches and functional approaches, and cognitive linguistics is more of a functional approach. Um, still others, um, you know, if you've come across some cognitive linguistic work, you probably have come across work on metaphors. And so I couldn't blame you for thinking that cognitive linguistics is sort of the linguistics of metaphors, but of course it's much more than that. We'll cover that. So um, you see the fourth little cloud there. Um, asking, is cognitive linguistics anti-Chomskyan? Is it? Well, let's explore this a bit. Um, now, if you listen to cognitive linguists, uh, you might get the idea that cognitive linguistics is so anti-Chomskyan. It's the definition of anti-Chomskyan. Yeah? But if you look a bit deeper, it actually emerges that there are quite a number of shared assumptions. Yeah? Things that generative linguists and cognitive linguists basically agree on. Yeah? For instance, they agree that the knowledge of language that a speaker has is the primary object of investigation. That is what we want to find out. We want to know what does a speaker know when they know a language. <clears throat> and uh, we want to build a working model of that knowledge. And a key aim uh, of linguistics. This has been um, to explain why some sentences are grammatical and others are not grammatical. 
Yeah, I've given you a little pair of examples here. In the mirror, John saw himself. That's a good sentence of English. English. You can you can ask any native speaker you like, and they'll tell you, yeah, that's a normal, ordinary sentence of English. And um, then you can ask them, okay, in the mirror himself saw John. Is that also a sentence of English? And they'll say, no, that is word soup. Yeah, not a grammatical sentence of English. And as a syntactician, you're beginning to wonder, well, why is that? Yeah, this is not just a coincidence. There must be an explanation for that. And uh, so th this is how syntactic theories come about. Right. Um, why this obsession with grammatical and ungrammatical sentences? Well, if you want to build a working model of linguistic knowledge, then this model should generate all the good sentences of English and it should not allow you to form all the bad sentences of English. If you arrive at that goal, you actually have a formalized working model of what linguistic knowledge must be like. And this has been the main goal for generative linguistics since, what, uh, 1957. Okay, and cognitive linguists have basically the same goal. They want to find out what people know when they know a language. So, shared assumptions between the Chomskyans and the not-so-Chomskyans. Now, of course, there are also rejections of fairly fundamental generative assumptions. For instance, uh, this idea that there is a universal grammar or a language acquisition device in the brain, a language instinct that is rejected. Yeah. Uh, cognitive linguists believe that there's, you, know, you can do without that. You can just learn language with uh, the help of domain general cognitive processes. Also, cognitive linguists uh, view very critically this idea that linguistic knowledge is organized in a modular fashion. Yeah. Uh, I call this here the grammar and dictionary view of linguistic knowledge, so that one module in your brain handles the grammar and syntax, all the rules basically, and then there's another component that has all the words and idioms and exceptions. Yeah? The cognitive linguistic view is that of an integrated, holistic uh, repository of linguistic units. The third point on this slide is that, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, in the cognitive worldview, knowledge of language emerges from language use. That's anathema to generativists. Yeah? So, um, frequency in the generative paradigm does not play a huge role. Frequency is fundamental in the cognitive uh, worldview. So, um, in more positive terms, what is cognitive linguistics as opposed to um, Chomskyan generative linguistics? Well, cognitive linguists attempt to describe what speakers know when they know a language. So that's a point of convergence. Um, they try to describe all the constructions, all the words, all the idioms, uh, and they attempt to relate that knowledge to general cognitive processes, such as categorization, schema formation, analogy, and so on and so forth. So the idea is, no, there is no language-specific wiring in your brain. Rather, language learning works. You can get it off the ground just with general cognitive processes. And then cognitive linguistics also attempts to explain how your knowledge of language comes into being through language use, that is, experience with language. Right, I want to move on to a contrast of psycholinguistics and cognitive linguistics. On the surface, it may seem that, well, you know, these two seem very much compatible, um, but there are some differences. So psycholinguistics, I'm not telling you anything new here, you probably know that, is um, interested in uh, the question, how does the human mind handle language? So uh, language processing, language production, language acquisition, those are three areas of psycholinguistic investigation. Um, unlike cognitive linguistics, psycholinguistics is not tied to a single theory of language. It's rather, you know, a subject matter that unites um, the different people doing psycholinguistics. Um, and also a certain methodology 
unites psycholinguists. So psycholinguistics has a much longer empirical tradition than cognitive linguistics. Yeah? So coming from psychology where uh, people have been working empirically for a long, long time, the focus in psycholinguistics is on so-called online data. That doesn't mean internet data, that does mean um, behavioral data that, that actual people produce. Yeah? So reaction times in response to some kind of stimulus, eye movements, if you give them a screen with figures to look at, brain imaging, these kinds of things. Okay, That is the bread and butter of the working psycholinguist. And well, <clears throat> how does cognitive linguistics stack up against this? Um, cognitive linguists are not so much concerned with processing, which you might find funny, yeah, but that's how it is. Um, but cognitive linguists are very much concerned with the question, what does language, the structures and forms of language, what do they tell us about the human mind? What can we infer about cognition looking at language? So cognitive linguists are very much concerned with language structures, including the forms, but also the meanings of language, and language representation, how it must be represented in the mind. Yeah. Unlike psycholinguistics, cognitive linguistics is conceived of as a theory of language, a theory of how language works, a theory of the knowledge that speakers have in their minds. Again, there are points of convergence. Psycholinguistics is also concerned with the construction of cognitive models, um, but no psycholinguist um, would attempt to build you know, the super model that explains it all, whereas cognitive linguists are a bit more bold in that regard, so they, you know, <clears throat> go for it. We'll explain everything. Okay, and um, cognitive linguists have for the longest time been using offline data. So linguistic examples like the in the mirror himself saw John, grammaticality judgments, and uh, corpus data. To be sure, there's a trend towards experimental methods towards more sophisticated corpus studies, but that's where it comes from, okay? From a very philological, um, language theoretical perspective. Right. Um, in terms of methodology, uh, psycholinguistics is very much a divide and conquer approach. So they're trying to define an object of study and um, <clears throat> try to investigate it in very fine detail. Things like word recognition, or syntactic parsing, or sentence comprehension, or anaphora resolution, the way that you link a pronoun to the noun phrase that it actually refers to. Yeah? So these are relatively small areas of investigation, and so um, psycholinguists who are concerned with these they would develop models that mimic human behavior with regard to these tasks as closely as possible. By contrast, cognitive linguistics is very much a theory of everything. Yeah? How language is represented in the mind, how it is learned and used, how it changes the universe and all the rest. Yeah? Okay, uh, I'm doing neither of the approaches justice really, but uh, as a caricature, uh, this will do. Moving on, um, is cognitive linguistics functional? Is it concerned with the functions of language? Yes, it is. So um, in functional linguistics, a basic assumption is that language is the way it is because it is used for communication. Yeah? So it is a tool for getting things done in the world. And um, so that means at <clears throat> the structures and forms of language that you see are the way they are because of the way they are used. So form follows function and this clashes with formal approaches which hold that the structures of language are determined by formal principles that are independent of functional pressures. Okay, let me first give you an example of where you see functional pressure in language. Have you ever wondered why the words that you use the most 
pronouns, articles, things like that, prepositions maybe, uh, are so short. Yeah? Words that you use often tend to be very short. Words that you use less often, they can be longer. Now, from a functional point of view, this makes total sense, yeah? uh, because the things that you use often, they need to be quick and handy and uh, you need to be uh, basically using them very fast. And so, well, there you have it. Um, <clears throat> language is efficient because, well, it's usage-based, it's functional, uh, it is used for communication. However, um, let me read these two examples here, um, which are an argument that a formalist would raise. Okay, you functionalists, explain me this. Um, here I have one sentence of English that's a grammatical sentence. This is the report that I filed before reading. Um, so, report is a noun, and then you have a relative clause that I filed uh, before reading and it is understood that what you read is the report. Um, okay, this relative clause construction works great, but um, if you try to do the same thing in the main clause, I filed the report before reading, native speakers of English will tell you um, that's not a sentence of English. Sorry to tell you, that's uh, ungrammatical. And you wonder, well, but it works in the relative clause construction and it's perfectly understandable what I wanted to say and why is this not a grammatical sentence of English? And they will say, I don't know. <laughs> it just is that way. And the formalist will say, see, that's because language structure has nothing to do with function. It has all and everything to do with form. Okay. I don't know how much you make of examples like these. They're certainly embarrassing if you're a dyed in the wool functionalist, like I am, for instance. Um, and, um, well, cognitive linguists ought to find some explanation that would, uh, well, convincingly show why it is crystal clear that I filed the report before reading must be ungrammatical. Okay. Um, moving on to the fourth cloud, is cognitive linguistics about metaphors? A resounding yes, cognitive linguistics is very well known for work on meaning in general and work on metaphor in particular. And um, what's the definition of metaphor in the cognitive framework? Well, uh, the, the crucial thing that cognitive linguistics does differently than say, other approaches to metaphor, there are gazillion approaches to metaphors. Um, so the cognitive approach uh, holds that the essence of metaphor is understanding one kind of thing in terms of another kind of thing. So metaphor is not just a matter of words, not just a matter of language. It's a cognitive thing. It's a, a way of seeing the world, of understanding complex things in terms of more simple things that we can relate to. Let me give you an example. Uh, here are classic examples. Uh, that you will find a lot. Uh, she attacked every weak point in my argument. Your claims are indefensible. You're going to get a lot of flack for those suggestions or they had to surrender to the force of our arguments. If you look at the underlined words here, uh, you notice that people are talking about sort of having um, an argument, discussing with each other, but the words they're using for that are semantically from a different field. They're from the field of fighting a war. So being in an argument, having a heated discussion, is talked about in terms of armed conflict, fighting a war. And so the idea is, well, if we talk about these things in terms of war, could it be that we are actually thinking about these things in terms of War. Yeah, do we think that an argument is kind of like fighting a war? That is the central point of conceptual metaphor theory. <clears throat> and to give you the uh, briefest summary ever of cogn uh, conceptual metaphor theory, you have two domains, the source domain that provides the vocabulary and the target domain, which is the thing that you're talking about, the thing that you're trying to understand. And... Uh, uh, between 
the two domains, between the source domain and the target domain, there are mappings so that uh, the participants in an argument in the target domain um, receive a mapping from the fighting parties in the domain of war. So we understand the arguing participants as the fighting parties in a war. We understand um, raising objections in the target domain in terms of attacking in a war. Maintaining your opinion is understood in terms of defending and giving up your opinion is understood in terms of surrendering to the enemy. Okay, I'll say more about metaphors uh, in the next episode. So, more about metaphor coming up. Right, these were the four questions that I wanted to raise. Um, is cognitive linguistics like psycholinguistics? Is it like functional linguistics? Is it about metaphors? Is it anti-Chomskyan? And I hope you have got a um, rough idea of what will happen in the next videos. So I'll see you next time.